guitar. Jamming good with weird and giving and the spiders from Mars. He played his left hand, but made it too far. Became the special man, and we were Ziggy's band. Hello and welcome to Wars Radio 2. I'm your host, James Robert Cruz Wilder, and we have a very special guest today, Wars author Nathan Patrick Butler. Say hello, Nathan. Hey, everybody. All right, we're going to be talking a bit about uh, Nathan's work with Wars, his uh, previous novella, Wars Earther One, Healers and Hunters, his upcoming novella, and some of his previous work in Star Wars and his own published works. All right, so first off, tell us a little about yourself, Nathan, um, just so the audience out there can get a little backstory on who you are. Sure. Well, uh, first let me say that writing is something that I've kind of fallen into by accident. It's not my primary career. My main career, the one that I went to school for, is a high school social studies teacher. So for the last 10 years, I've been teaching things like economics, a constitutional law, I'm now teaching advanced placement world history, regular world history, I and mean, all these different courses that fall under social studies in the state of Georgia and the college board's AP course. And that's where my master's is, that's where my uh, bachelor's degree is. So to me, from a career standpoint, it's always been this buildup of educational repertoires and, and what can I teach and how can I best help those students and such. But it turns out that I guess that same impetus that pushes me towards that pushed me into doing, back in 1997, uh, I started working on a thing called the Star Wars Timeline Project, now called the Star Wars Timeline Gold. It's essentially a comprehensive Star Wars chronology. The new edition next year, or I guess this year, because it's New Year's Eve when we're recording this, uh, the next edition of that is going to wind up being over 2,000 pages. I mean, it's gigantic. covers everything. But my work in that eventually got me into Star Wars podcasting, and along the way, it got the attention of folks at Dark Horse Comics, which wound up with me getting a chance to write for Star Wars Tales. And then that gave me the confidence to put out some self-published stuff. And then the self-published stuff got the attention of Josh Radke over at Grail Quest Books, who brought me in to write for Wars. So it's kind of been like the writing thing was never a career choice per se, so much as something that I've just been blessed to have the opportunity alongside my regular career as I've gone along to get a chance to do. So I'm podcaster, educator, and writer all at the same time, which means very little sleep, but I'm sort of a busybody in that sense, I guess. So to me, you know, the work of writing and the work of podcasting is more stress relief than stressful for me. Wow, well, that's quite the repertoire you've got going on. So your first uh, Wars novella, The uh, Healers and Hunters, can you tell us a little bit more about um, how the whole project got started with you writing that? Sure. Well, it was, I guess, gosh, I want to say maybe September, October, November-ish, the latter chunk of, I guess it was 2009, maybe 2008. I mean, it's, it all kind of becomes a blur. Uh, but, uh, but a few years ago, a couple years ago, Josh Radke contacted me through uh, email and basically said, or I guess a, a email or Facebook message, like I said, it all kind of blends together. He contacts me sort of out of the blue saying, hey, I've seen this stuff that you're doing with the greater good and these self-published works of mine, said, uh, how would you like to write for Wars? And of course, for me, I had no idea what Wars was at the time. I knew that Decipher had continued on with the Star Wars CCG game mechanics in some form, but by that point, I had sort of stepped away from the card gaming stuff. I had played this, the CCG quite a bit, the Star Wars CCG, but around the time that it made the jump over to Witches of the Coast was the same time that Decipher was launching Wars, and that was as I was getting out of it. I had stopped probably around the Jabba's Palace expansion. So I really wasn't following it as much. So as soon as he mentioned that, I started doing some research into it. I went ahead and agreed to write for the series. And it really started out with a very, very general theme. We wanted to write something set three years prior to the game itself that would lead up to and through the Battle of Phobos. So no uh, Quay, no She all just the three human factions leading into this big confrontation. And he laid out that essentially what we'd have is what you could say is either a nine-book series or a trilogy of trilogies, however you want to look at it, where there's three books for each of the three factions. And he wanted me to write the first of the Earther faction. It winds up being that I eventually wind up writing two for the Earther faction, but initially it was just, you know, let's get the first three taken care of. 
But beforehand, he's coming up with ideas for general themes going throughout all nine books. How is it all going to lead up to the Battle of Phobos? What's going to be revealed where? And once we had that backbone, we had to pick who are our main characters. He was really good at describing what we wanted to do with these characters because the... The, the game itself doesn't really lend itself to saying these are the heroes, the villains. It's not as black or white as that. But also, just like you could say there are heroes and villains on any side, depending on the person's point of view, there's also not a core group of characters that are the heroes. I mean, you take Earthers, and you could list out tons and tons of people who could be the heroes of a story, because they're individual character cards. Well, that's lovely and all, except... You need to have some recognizable characters where when someone thinks of your saga, there's a handful they can point out. Like if they say Star Wars, it's Luke, Leia, Han, Anakin, Padme, stuff like that. Uh, I guess now Ahsoka. <laughs> if someone were to say uh, Star Trek, you know, Kirk, Picard, that sort of thing. He said, well, we need, what we need sort of is a fellowship of wars. We need a fellowship like in Lord of the Rings where these, these main characters come together, know each other, and through them our story is going to be told. So we had to start figuring out which characters are going to stand out for each of the different factions. Once that was decided, come up with some general outlines of what we wanted to do for the first set of novellas, as long as they fit in with that broader plan. And then it becomes kind of the same process you would expect with, for instance, when I wrote for Star Wars Tales, which is that if you have a licensed work, which this is, you've got the writer's level, you've got the publishing company level, and then you've got the copyright holder level. So I guess the, the licensor, the licensee, and the writer from the top down. Which meant that once we got those outlines figured out, Josh at Girl Quest Books had to figure it, had to uh, approve it, figure out whether or not it was going to work. Then that gets passed on to Decipher. Once that's done, the word comes back, and then we turn around and actually start writing. Then that goes through him and Decipher. It, it starts to become a very sort of three-level process, but a very simple process, I guess. Uh, it's, it feels more complex than it actually is because really it's just – the writer writes, and it has to be approved on the two levels above it, really. So it started very general, but then it became sort of the process I think that any licensed work would fall in. Right. Uh, going back to a point you made a little bit ago, um, the different characters and choosing ones who are really iconic for each faction, it, it's really a choice that's made the novella series feel a lot more cohesive and like a real story than uh, the Wars Project back in 2004-2005 did. Um, back then, if you read all the short stories, some of the only characters who stand out are uh, Kajiko Tarako and uh, Nick Starhawk Murren, mainly because they get multiple short stories where they appear in. Um, and some people credit that with, well, I don't think credit's the right word, but you know, say that's something that uh, was really a deficit to it, that you couldn't really latch on to these people. Um, well, I'd say that, uh, you know, the first Earther novella, over those 100 pages, you know, you really got to care about those people. And uh, so do you think that's been a pretty good move then? Yeah, I think so. I think that the, the hard part of it was figuring out who to choose, because there are some awesome characters in Wars. They all have a lot of potential. And... In the case, for instance, of the Earther stuff, one of the things was, okay, not only do you have to figure out which characters are you going to use, but you also have to figure out, you know, in each of these cases, it's almost like those starter decks, you know, where most of the starter decks had two different factions in them. Each of the novellas tends to, not all of them, but most of them tend to have two different factions playing into it. For instance, the first Earther novella that I wrote was basically Mavericks and Earthers, and the second one is essentially Earthers and Gonjin. And you have to be careful to make sure that whatever characters you're using from the other faction aren't going to wind up contradicting or running into some problems with the other books. you got to be very careful to make sure that they integrate. I think planning that ahead of time was a definite plus to the entire creative process here. And... You know, I don't think that I would have thought of that. I don't think that most people would have thought of that unless you're in a position like Josh is over the entire line to be able to say there needs to be a better, bigger plan than just here's a story, here's a story, here's a story. Like you said, with the old short stories, it was kind of a, you know, tell stories about whoever. And in our case, it, it by focusing on specific smaller groups of characters, you can get in their heads a little bit more. You can care about them a bit more. But it was a definite... It was difficult to choose the individual characters. I actually originally was planning on having the main character of the first Earther novella being Chan Whitmer, because I liked the idea of the spy-type story. 
only that really didn't fit the broader theme of what we wanted to do to create these big uh, heroic characters like building up Rogan Hallard, for instance. So I wind up going with the, the Z-Labs connection, the healers and hunters, the, the military slash uh, scientist slash medical uh, group. Huh. Any plans to ever uh, put Chan back into one of the novellas someday? Actually, you will see Chan, if only briefly, showing up in the pages of the second Earther novella, which right now the working title still needs to be approved. The working title is On Red Soil. So you will see Chan at least briefly, though he's not a... He, he's sort of the one who winds up kicking off part of that story as opposed to being someone who is a main character through the story. Because at this point, the character is essentially... He's still an Earther agent on Ganjin trying to blend in and work behind the scenes as uh, for Sai Sin. And you can't have a covert operative doing all these really overt actions without blowing his cover. So he's there, he's in it, but he's not going to wind up being our focal point character for that one. Right, cool. Um, now, we're going to get to a Earth or two in just a moment here, but I wanted to ask you about uh, the reception to your first novella after you wrote it. Um, you know, the response from fans. I know you went to uh, Con Carolina. Can you tell us a little bit about that in general? Yeah, each year I go to Con Carolinas. I have been for about the last almost 10 years, I guess eight or nine years, give or take. And it's kind of a neat little convention where it's getting bigger and bigger. But it's still personal enough. You get to know the people that are there. You get a chance to have individual conversations with, you know, the writers who are there, the actors, actresses who are there. It's it's one of those things that's growing. And maybe I'm a little biased on it because I get to be on panels every year. So I've had the chance to be on the panels with some of these people. But I, I mean, it's there, it's it's awesome to be able to sit there alongside more established people like Jerry Purnell and have him say, you know what, doing a series the way they're doing with Wars, where it's broken down into one long story by many authors, but each author has their own book, they're just collaborating on the big stuff, that's the wave of the future. To hear somebody who's very established say that is awesome. So I really enjoy always going to those, and being able to talk about Wars this time, it got people to realize that Wars was coming back with the novellas, uh, it gave me a chance to answer questions about it, I was actually surprised how many people there uh, were excited to see that Wars was coming back, because again, I had not had the exposure to Wars prior to when Josh came to me about writing for it. And that there's a lot of folks who were there who were like, wow, I hadn't thought about that franchise in years, but this sounds great. And I even saw some people pulling out decks of Wars cards. I guess they just brought huge, huge containers full of all the different card games they had for the gaming room, pulling out some of those and playing them in little impromptu Wars games. So it, it's been fun. I haven't had as much contact, I guess, in person as, say, Jim did uh, going to the event that you guys held. But, you know, every now and then you'll be surprised how many people actually remember Wars and get excited about the novellas. Now I guess it's a matter of just getting the word out about the novella. Uh, yeah, well, speaking of uh, other Wars authors, um, how has it been working with the uh, different authors collaborating all of this? You mentioned Jim Perry, author of the Mavericks novellas, and uh, there's also Shawnee Williams and Sabrina Freed. Am I pronouncing that right? I always pronounced it fried. I don't think I've ever heard her pronounce her name, but she had a, a, a series of columns about Star Wars that were up online for a while called, I, I would assume, Fried Circuits, maybe Freed Circuits, um, but Sabrina, Sabrina F., as she calls herself on Facebook. Yeah, uh, yeah so has it uh, been working with Sabrina Fried? Uh, the, the whole, uh, yeah. I would say the whole process has been interesting. It's It started out with a lot of ideas being tossed around in these group emails, you know, reply all type emails. Hey, let's do this. Hey, what if this happened? Hey, what if this was done? And to start off, there wasn't a lot of collaboration necessary other than those big, broader stroke types of ideas. Because the original, the first three novellas, volume one for each faction, were pretty separate stories. They were just laying the foundation for these characters. As we move into volume twos and volume threes, it starts to entwine quite a bit more. And I would say, you know, I, probably the person I worked least with directly was Sean because his first novella, the, the first Gaunjin novella, really did not tie in as much to what was going on with the Earthers and Mavericks. It was much more about two different eras in Gaunjin history. But then you take Jim, for instance. Jim and I have known each other for a while, ever since he got into the Star Wars podcasting field. In fact, when Josh came to me saying, hey, would you like to be part of this? One of the other things he said was, let me know if you know any people who are talented as writers who might be interested. 
And Jim was someone who I had known, again, through the Star Wars uh, podcasting community, but he had done a really entertaining, witty, uh, banter-based story called Star Wars Codename Starkeeper. It's a Star Wars fan-made audio drama over at StarWarsFanWorks.com. And he really nailed it, I thought, on that one. And I said, you know what? I know he's doing that. I know he's been working on his own novel project. I think Jim could do this. So I suggested Jim over to Josh. And then I guess we were kind of surprised to see, or I was kind of surprised to see Sabrina come in because I knew her from her Star Wars columns and, and hadn't realized that Josh was speaking with her. So she came in with Jim. It was sort of an idea bouncing some ideas back and forth as he was getting used to wars, as I had just done a lot of research into wars. I picked up the RPG books and picked up, now I've got all but two of the cards. I think it's Premeditated Reaction and uh, Seattle Dark Side are the only ones I'm missing. And uh, in the process of that, it was just kind of basic banter, basic ideas back and forth. With Sabrina, we were working at a very similar time period from different angles where some of the things that happen or were going to happen in early drafts of her first Ganja novella, the second of the Ganja series, they were tying into setting up and in some cases clashing with some of the things that we were doing with Earther 2. And we had to go back and forth quite a bit to make sure that everything fit between those two. Very much like I would assume maybe, say, the Star Wars authors writing Legacy of the Force, New Jedi Order, Fate of the Jedi, any of those books, when they're trying to set up things where you can hand off from one book to the other, it's got to make sure that it all makes sense. And at the end, we wound up with stronger products, I think, on both ends of that, Earther 2 and Ganjin 2. But there was a lot of, of trying to work out the specific details. And I would imagine that with the third volume of all three of them, it'll be even more complex. Uh, fortunately, I guess for me and my sanity, the third volumes are being written by Jim, Sean, and Josh. I will not be on that, that last trilogy of the, of the trilogy. Gotcha. All right. Well, wow, that sounds really great that you guys managed to have that level of uh, collaboration and uh, cooperation, getting that uh, the last set of volumes on that done, which uh, leads into the uh, big focal topic here, which everyone out there listening probably wants to hear about, Earther 2, your uh, newest novella. Now, if you were going to uh, sum up what Earther 2 was in a friendly, spoiler-free sort of way... Uh, what would you say about it? I would say that it is the it's it's the saber rattling before conflict actually opens. There are two characters in there that I believe are mentioned in Gonjin Two in Sabrina's book that at, at Red Lion Blue Lion, which at this point are not from the game. That one of them is a character named Ito Ryu. He's a member of the Atarashi Hajimari, the leadership group on Gonjin, and he is actually slated to be someone who appears in the upcoming Grail Quest books comic series, the first three-issue arc of the Wars comic series. And so he was sort of hinted at before. He takes a major part of the story in this case, and he's trying to do what he thinks is in the best interest of Gonjin, but also in the best interest of his political career. He wants to be a future president of Gonjin once Sato Satoshi is gone. And then you've got another new character, this one... I'm not sure if the reference to him is still in Ganja 2 or not. I know it was in an earlier draft. Uh, Kipley Darnell. And Kipley, or Kip, usually referred to just as Kipley, is Earth's ambassador to Ganja at this point. And by the start of Earth or 2, he is the only diplomatic presence that Earth still has on Ganja. And we wind up with a story that essentially, it feels very much like, I would say to a degree, A New Hope, or at least part of Star Wars Episode Four, A New Hope, in that, in our case... What's the most secretive thing that you would want to find plans for if you're Earth hunting around for info on Ganjin? Well, it's not a Death Star. It's the Nobots at this point. And Chan Whitmer, our character that we mentioned a bit ago, Chan Whitmer, 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 Chan Whitmer shows up with enough data that they can't quite figure out what it is that they're seeing happening on Ganjin, but resources are moving and they think that if this information can get back to Earth, get back to Saisen in London Plex, they'd be able to piece it together and figure out exactly what is going on on Gonjin. Right now it's a bunch of disparate information, some encoded, some not. Uh, so they're going to have to crack into it to even get to it in the first place. And he brings that to Kipley Darnell, the ambassador's attention, with the idea being that the ambassador is going to be the one who, if they're right, 
is going to be able to get the information off the planet because they're not letting a lot of inter-system traffic go on at this point because of the blockade around Ganjin. The only way it seems likely to get that information out is with the ambassador actually carrying it away. They don't risk sending it because Shocho might notice it, somebody else might intercept it. And the assumption is that eventually diplomatic ties are going to be completely cut. So even if he can't get it off the planet before then, when those ties are cut, Kip will be able to take it off the planet. And at this point, our Hajimari character, Ito Ryu, he believes that it's dishonorable to be where they stand right there. I, we are looking at a situation where diplomacy has failed. Diplomacy is failing. No one, it seems, on either side really believes it's going to be possible to avoid war. It's just a matter of time. It's very much like uh, Earth during the uh, real Earth history during the Cuban Missile Crisis, where most people think that this is inevitable. How do you stop this oncoming train? This avalanche is coming towards you. You're not going to be able to stop it alone. In his case, he, for, for political reasons, that will give him a leg up. And for just reasons of what he thinks is best for Ganjin, he's of the mind that, you know what, if diplomacy isn't going to work anymore, it's time to just end it. It's dishonorable to operate under this false pretense that somehow, you know, something could still come diplomatically of this when no one believes that's really the case. So he takes it upon himself, without getting approval elsewhere, to basically tell the ambassador, you're gone. You're out of here. Goodbye. Uh, the Atarashi Hajimari will thank me for this later. The problem is, by the time he says, get out of here, Kipley has the information. And by the time we get to about the third chapter, second or third chapter, we now have a problem. Because Kipley disappears. Kipley is supposed to be on his way back to the Atlantis to meet with Horatio Hicks and James Howler and them, and he's just vanished. And the question is, who has stopped him? Did they find out what he's carrying and try to stop him? Was Ito Ryu behind it? Was someone else on Ganja behind it? Has he gone into hiding himself? Did he do this on purpose? Is he dead? Is he alive? What's the deal? And simply because of all the political pressures involved in a situation like that, Earth is allowed to send a small group of people to help the Ganjin find the missing ambassador or find out what happened to him. And in this case, because of his own decent relationship with the Ganjin that's explored a little bit actually in the book, the people chosen to do that on Earth's side are Rogan Hallard and Jerlin Cray of the Shadow Surfer, and the individual who goes with them, partially to keep an eye on them, partially because you know they know they can trust her, is Janet Yens from Sison, who of course they met in the previous book. So it's essentially a story where our three main Earther characters there, along with help from Ganjin, are trying to find the missing ambassador protect that information, and at the same time, you've got these Ganjin forces at play that maybe want him gone, maybe don't, and they all have their own roles to play in the broader scheme of things in, in what sort of amounts to almost a chase, very much like you could say that in, at its backbone, a big chunk of Star Wars A New Hope is a chase to find the person, or droid in that case, with these this information, to get the information, stop the information from spreading whatever it may be. So you get that premise very early on in the story, and then after that it's very much a, a, a chase to get that information off the planet for the Earth. Wow, you know, uh, I think it's a testament to uh, the series so far that I felt an upwelling of joy when I heard the uh, whole gang from the first novella was going to be back together going on this next adventure. <laughs> yeah, I like the idea of build, giving a chance to build up the characters, because, I mean, at this point we've met them before, not a lot of background and not a lot of the conversation between the characters has to be used to build the characterization to start with. Now we can build on the first novella, build on the connections between them. I think you're going to find that the relationship, and, I, and that's probably not the best word to use, the, the friendship, the relationship, the connection that builds between especially Janet and Rogan, the trust that gets built there. It's probably not going to go where a lot of people think it could as soon as I say relationship and trust between the two, but there's definitely a building of a connection between Janet and Rogan that allows them to trust each other and be willing to put their faith in each other in, in a way that you didn't even see back in Earth or One. In that case, it was trust based on desperation. You didn't have a choice of who you trusted if you wanted to survive. In this case, that trust can be built over a lot more of an interaction that's not in a our lives are in danger sort of forced type of situation. And I think you're going to find that the more we learn about Rogan's background, the more we see how Rogan deals with the situations as seen in there, 
the more that Rogan is going to start to feel like a much more heroic character. I mean, he sort of already is anyway. We got a little bit of his background with the whole idea of his family being mostly in medical fields, which is actually my dad's side of the family is mostly medical fields. I and mean, my sister's a nurse. Uh, my dad's a veterinarian. My stepmom is a vet tech. I've got an aunt that's a nurse. I mean, there's a lot of, of medical background there. And yet he chose to follow the piloting path. He, but he still winds up with that medical thing, too, because he's part of Z-Labs as opposed to some other group. We're going to find here a little bit more about him in terms of his honor in his background, uh, an incident in his background that sort of ingratiated him to a degree with the Ganjin, where the Ganjin look at him as opposed to most Earthers as someone with honor. Uh, I think probably of all the characters that show up again from the first book that I wrote, from Healers and Hunters, it's Jerlin that doesn't get as much development here because I think a lot of the banter between him and Rogan set him up pretty solidly in the first one. Now we get to see where the others go from there. How is Janet adjusting to being with Sison now, somewhat under the thumb of Jylan Wraith, who now knows more about her uh, and can hold the last mission's situation and, and the secret of that, trying to keep that from being known over her head. How does she deal with that? So yeah, definitely a lot more chances at character exploration, and I'm interested to see where Josh is going to go with it, because when he writes Earther 3, he'll be picking up where these threads leave off and where Kipley's thread leaves off. And and I've really been... Kipley was a character named uh, by Tony Zor, who was going to be a, a person who was with the team at one point, but decided not to, uh, and a, a character concept that's been there er since early on. But I've got a chance to actually flesh out the character, which is which has been very fun. He's a character who's sort of torn between two worlds. He's an Earther diplomat, but his wife is Gonjin. He's got a child who is essentially uh, torn between two cultures. Granted, a very young child, but essentially torn between two cultures. And as as we see this, the and that's one thing that's sort of missing in Wars is you don't have a lot of the characters that are torn between two allegiances. Here is a character who, while well, his allegiance is to Earth, you can sort of see that if, if the conflict in the solar system between Earth and Ganjin is the macrocosmic conflict, then he is the microcosm. His family is, in a sense, going through the same type of turmoil that the solar system is. So a lot more chance for character development now that the foundation has been laid. Okay, that guy sounds interesting. Um you know, there's a within the wars fan bases. There is everyone tends to break off into you know what their exact favorite um, you know faction within the game is, and often they'll go and uh, you know kind of stereotypically villainize the other factions when you know they're talking amongst themselves. Uh, it, you know, it's pretty common to hear wars fan to say, "Oh, the Ganjin communists, Earther capitalist pigs." You know that kind of joking banter. Oh yeah, we've there's you will actually hear a capitalist pig joke between Rogan and Jerlin. They assuming it stays in the final draft that winds up being uh, produced. We we have a couple of moments where in front of Gonjin, we've got the Shadow Serper crew mocking each other in the stereotypes that Gonjin tend to look at them as. It it's an amusing little segment. <laughs> Excellent. Um, but I'm glad you have that sort of um almost genre bending character there that uh you know transcends what people you know actually even i really expect from wars often that it has this kind of secular factionism because of how the card game was originally built sort of yeah i mean his thing kipley's thing in this case is he is someone who i mean he's a diplomat if uh, if you read through ganjin 2 then we've briefly met the previous, uh, one of the previous ambassadors who was heading up the Earth mission. And there's always, it, it's, the idea of diplomacy between the two is already kind of hinky because from Earth's perspective, that's their territory. So why do you have an ambassador to your own territory? So just that kind of concession at all is, is kind of stretching the definitions of how these two sides should relate to each other. But in Kipley's case, in becoming a diplomat, he doesn't have all the military training. This is someone who, his education is going to be in things like history. It's going to be in things like previous diplomacy. So he can see these things, and, and, and as a history teacher, it allows me to work in various themes where he sees things in terms of how we use history to judge things. I mean, this, for instance, if you look at what's happening uh, uh, to a degree, if you look at it from the standpoint of of one way, it's kind of like the American Revolution. 
On the other hand, it's also kind of like the American Civil War, and that's where it is. Is it are they parts of one society where one group is trying to break away from essentially a tacit agreement to be part of that society, which is sort of the way Earth looks at it. You know, it's it's like Earth is the North and the Gaugian are the South, the Confederate States of America, and they are fighting to keep them together or reunite them. Or is it more like what the way that Gaugian looks at it, where Gaugian essentially is early America or the early American colonies, and Earth is essentially this massive imperialist power that they're trying to break away from. And you could look at it as, as a parallel to either way. Both sides, based on their point of view, have their own logical, reasonable rationale for why things should end the way they want it to end, either with humanity united or separated. So Kipley, just being a character who's torn between the two, uh, has a unique point of view, but because he's not a warrior, he's able to bring in some other points of view and some other concepts and some other more humanities, and by humanities I mean like a, a, both a human perspective but also a, like a human history background perspective uh, to the whole scenario. I think it's a point of view that I, I know that Earther 1 was somewhat missing because Earther 1 was very combat oriented. It was get in there, save the lives. Now we have a character who doesn't have to be a fighter he can give us that uh, that reading point of view that's going to give us a little more of a, uh, a, a a less black or white type of background, I guess. Yeah, you know, you, know, you really got the hard job with the uh, first Earther novella, basically having to Tim Zahn, the um, Wars universe, giving everyone their opening to, you know, they hadn't read anything before. And, uh, you know, the sounds of Earther 2 and really all the other... Uh, we've already read the Gonjin too, or you have at least you have the opportunity to read it since it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Um, but you, you know, you really had the chance to expand all of this in ways that you weren't able to before. Uh, I remember, you know, I've talked to you before a little bit about uh, historical parallels and. Your, your insights there just in the last few minutes about um, Gonjin versus Earth and its relations to things in history, you know, that's the kind of thing which, you know, I've heard people discussing that sort of thing, but it's really great to get to have the chance to really have it played out within wars in depth like this. Yeah, well, one of the things that Josh said to us very early on, I don't know if this is something that was his idea originally or if someone else had said it before, so I'm not sure who to credit it to, but one thing that he said was it's sort of like you take the general concept that we have with uh, the United States, right? And we, in the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson refers to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. He's sort of aping an idea from John Locke where Locke's talking about life, liberty, and property with the idea that pursuit of happiness in a sense is pursuit of property in one form or another, pursuit of making things better for yourself. It's that economic concept of profit motive. You know, you're choosing things that better you, not purposely harm you, basically. That's why they call them goods, not bads, when we buy things. But he said, well, take that and think of the three human factions as different elements of this. Uh, your life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness are your property. You could have the Mavericks representing one, the Gonjan representing another, Earth representing another, and it's almost as though that American ideal has now been shattered in a sense. And it definitely gives you this – it gave me at least a sense reading it that as much as we tend to think of these as opposite sides, there's more that unites them than divides them in a lot of ways, but it's the things that divide them that are getting all the attention. So you can sort of play into this thing where you can have characters – for instance, there's one character in Earth or Two who is Gonjin who somewhat admires Rogan because of some of his previous actions. And it gives you a chance to see that, you know, we are all still people. It doesn't matter what faction you're in. It's politics that's dividing them. It's, it's uh, I guess, sort of the rationalizing of each side's position that divides it. But in the grand scheme of things, we are all still connected. And I think that's something that if we take this forward and eventually wind up in, say, the era of the game itself, it gives a little bit of hope that maybe when these two alien races are duking it out and catching humanity in the middle, maybe there's some hope that some of these Earther uh, or Earth-spawned groups, whether it's Mavericks, Gonjin, whoever, might actually be able to work together against a common foe as opposed to making this an absolute free-for-all where I mean, it seems to me, 
I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but looking at the five factions of wars in the game era, they're so well balanced and so well defined on either side that it's not just it's hard to tell who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. I look at it in the grand scheme of things and say, if this continues forward from a storytelling standpoint, I'm not sure there can be a winner. I think wars is a, you know, it, the only way to win is not to fight, to not get involved in the first place. Everybody's going to take losses. Everybody's going to wind up seeing themselves on the short end of the stick at some point along the way. If there's not some way to get some of these factions to someday work together, we're basically looking at at massive destruction across the solar system and everybody comes out losing. It's like a nuclear war. Nobody wins a nuclear war. Uh, so I, I like the idea of laying the foundation of something a little more human and a little more inter interconnected uh, than than what is often seen the way that people tend to approach games where the fa the sides are so easily split. They're, it's kind of like the uh, the gray areas of like a Qui-Gon Jinn in Star Wars as opposed to other Jedi. You know, he's willing to see disparate points of view and it may make it uncomfortable for some of the other characters, but at the same time, it's a perspective that's really needed. Yeah, um, and you're writing, uh, you know, these novels are prequels right now set long before the uh, Shi and the Quay show up even at all, which, you know, adds a differing element in, um, it, you know, it was really different reading the first Earther novella because there was only the interaction of just humanity. And it, it was a very different dynamic there without having everything split basically five ways. And the worries about, you know, well, the Shi are godlike. Are they just going to dominate everyone? You know, are the Quay going to try to take a foothold somewhere? And, you know, the, the sort of way that those two aliens break up this almost Cold War-style deadlock that the you know, Maverick, Gonjin, and Earther societies have going on. Oh, yeah. And what I like, is, or one of the things I'm interested in, eventually, once we get done with this full novella series, once my next one comes out, which should be early this year, and then we'll have, let's see, I guess Jim's got the next uh, Maverick one, and then it winds up with uh, uh, Sean, Sabrina, and Josh doing those those third volumes from each side. One of the things that's, that's in the works is to bring together a lot of the, the old wars fiction, the stuff that, that the licenses can be used for, bring those together into an anthology that would include other individual new stories by members of the creative team at Grail Quest Books, whether it's us who worked on the novellas or some of the other folks also attached to Grail Quest Books. And I like the idea. I'm already starting to come up with ideas for what type of short story I'd want to tell, because it's not just that the aliens aren't in the picture, uh, the Kaizen powers aren't in the picture. You know, none of these characters have their special, uh, almost supernatural abilities yet. And how would that affect a character that we've seen previously? I mean, we've got characters like Jostle Swin. Uh, the, one of the reasons I picked Jostle Swin to be a character in the first Earther novella is I wanted to give some reason behind that hatred of Mavericks that he has. I want to give some reason behind why he was busted down from one rank to another. But also, Seeing him in the cards, seeing him in what little he appears in those short stories. I want to say it's Anticipation, I think, was a short story he was in. You don't get to see much of him, but you know what the powers are and what he could do. Where was this person before? You know, where was he before he got those abilities? And now I get a chance to sort of do it the other way around. If there's any characters out of, say, Earther 2 or Earther 1, I guess it'd have to be Earther 2. A lot of people in Earther 1 were kind of red shirts. Uh, in Earther 2, any of these characters have the potential, if they survive, to come back someday in one of those short stories or elsewhere and possibly have the ability to have those abilities. And how does that change a person? It, it's a lot, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like what Heroes, for instance, and the comic book series Rising Stars did for superheroes. How do you take a regular person, a very realistic person, throw these powers at them? How does that person cope? How do they use it? What do they use with it? What does it bring out in them? Is, is it shaped by their personality? So I'm I'm excited to eventually get a chance to dip back into wars once the anthology comes around because I like the idea of taking uh, you're right these are essentially prequels they're a story in and of themselves but the best part about a prequel is that you can then expand on things beyond what already existed in a lot of ways it's like say with Star Wars we've got the prequel movies we got the the original three Star Wars films but now that we have both of those there are authors able to pick up story threads after even the original films from the 70s and 80s and build on both. That you get that double foundation. Now that we're laying that second part of the foundation here, I'm eager to see where we can go with that double foundation for wars. 
yeah, especially such a large foundation. Um, I'm pretty sure I compiled all of the short stories together once, and they total only about uh, 300-ish pages. So, you know, with the uh, novellas, you've already got a uh, base, which is larger than the original fiction line. Yeah, the original fiction, the thing that I like about it is you do have a lot of different points of view. So it's not just, you know, one character all the time. But at the same time, because they were such short tales and because they were covering so many places, they didn't get to go as much in depth. So I like the fact that it gives us a place to jump off from. I'd love to see something tie those together a little bit more, like some thread behind the scenes. Right now for the the Star Wars podcasting stuff that I do, I just finished reading the Darth Plagueis novel that comes out here in January. And one of the things I like about that is it takes all these different stories that already existed and gives a backbone that connects them all in some way. I'd love to see something with Wars do that that connects some of those short stories a little bit more closely together. And I do like the fact that we are staying true not just to the game but also to those stories. I mean, anytime we write for these, there's research into the history of the faction stuff from the RPG books, hard lore, even those short stories. I mean, the whole reason why Janet Yen's after Earther 1, when she enters Sai Sin, comes in at the rank that she does, is that we know that she actually goes up to the rank she is in the game in the short story cloud. So it, it uses that as a stepping stone. It's yet another source to draw from. But it'd be nice to see much more use of those short stories. Of course, now, though, they're, they're not as well known and not as readily available. So it's just a matter of, you know, as those come out as the anthology and such, seeing where we can go with them. I think between all the different creative minds behind the new stuff, I think you're going to see some very interesting uh, new additions to the short story family. Now, I wouldn't be able to uh, get away from uh, talking about Earther 2 with you without asking a bit about uh, if there are any cameos from people from the short story or the cards that uh, fans of them out there could look forward to seeing, even if only in brief. I will say that it keeps the cast of characters relatively small, you are going to wind up seeing Hicks and Howler, albeit only briefly, but the dynamics between those two men are something that I think you're going to find interesting as we head towards Earther 3. There is one extremely familiar Ganjin character who will appear, not as the primary character, but within the scope of the different you know, factions and how they're trying to deal with the disappearance of Kipley Darnell, we will be seeing a certain Ganjin woman who has gotten a lot of uh, play before, put, uh, put mildly. So there's those. There's also some new characters that show up. You'll find some Tuckerisms in there, the, the named after things. There's a ship that'll have a familiar sounding name that, uh, to fans of the Wars fan community. You'll also find that there is one new Ganjin character, a new character, but named based on a name from when I put a request on the Facebook page. It said, hey, I need a name for a Ganjin character. Toss me out some ideas, and this one, for what it means, was a perfect fit. So you'll see different things like that. You'll see some not quite cameos, but Tuckerisms, as they call them, out to the fan community. And you'll see at least, you know, Chan briefly. You'll see Hicks and Howler. You'll see that Gonjin character. But it certainly, it feels like it's a smaller cast to me than the first one. Because the first one had, you had your Mavericks, you had two different Earther groups involved. And one of the Earther groups was pretty large, the, the original patrol craft group. So... It's, it may not exactly be a smaller cast, but it certainly feels that way once you are actually start seeing the roles these characters play. It's, there's not as many characters to split the action between this time. That's part of why I'm able to give them a little more depth this time. Yeah, um, you also mentioned a lot of times throughout this uh, interview that, um, that... You've also mentioned a lot of times throughout this interview historical parallels. I touched on that a little bit before. Um... But are there any more you'd like the uh, anyone who picks up Earther 1 or 2 to think about while they're reading them? Now, I think I've hit on a lot of them. I think the big thing is to just to keep in mind that the historical parallels, in a sense, it helps us to understand what's going on. It also, I think, gives us a grounding in history, which is one of the things that wars can do that something like a Star Wars can't, because it's set in a galaxy far, far away. Wars is built around our present leading off into this future that's been created for the franchise. So you do get a chance to tie it back to events, sort of seeing that people are still people. We still make the same mistakes. 
I would say that at this point, with Earther 2, again, it's almost like the Cuban Missile Crisis in a sense. There's there's something that is brewing that could get out of control. Uh, some people who want war, who are sort of pushing for it, like some of the military commanders uh, back during the Cuban Missile Crisis, who like, like LeMay, who think, you know, why not get into a conflict with the Soviet Union? We'll beat them anyway. Uh, in fact, one of the one of the things that are mentioned very, very late in Earther 2 is a parallel. I think it actually comes from a news broadcast that one of the characters sees. And it's the comparison of Athens and Sparta. When, a- when Athens and Sparta went to war against each other, they both believed, this is in ancient Greece, they both believed they could win. You don't go into a war that you know you're going to lose. Well, here's two groups again, Earth and Ganjin, who believe that if a war starts, they'll win. So there are people on both sides who think, why not go into a war, while others are trying to stop it. It's very much like the Cold War. It's very much like the Cuban Missile Crisis as part of the Cold War. It's like almost any time where you see tensions ratcheting themselves up in human history, and you'll see parallels there. Things like there's an, there's an event that's the equivalent of diplomats burning documents in their embassies before the outbreak of hostilities, you know, kicking away of the different uh, what you call it, the different ambassadors and such. I will say that one thing I purposely it's not mentioned directly, but you may remember that in in real history back in 1941 there were still diplomatic connections going on between the United States and Japan when Japan attacked us at Pearl Harbor, and the Gonjin with their background going back to basically East Asia, including Japan, are not falling into that trap this time around. Thanks to Ito Ryu, they're absolutely not keeping those diplomatic ties before hostilities begin. He's trying to cut those ties himself. So there are some instances where maybe not overtly, it doesn't say that that's a historical parallel, but there are some times where I've purposely made sure that something that might be a historical error that someone made they're not fo- they're not necessarily following all the same mistakes again. Sometimes we have actually learned from them. But in those cases, we're talking things that are such a small little piece just weaved into the general storytelling. I think a lot of the historical things people won't necessarily notice. And I'm sure there are things that we wind up working into the stories that are historical parallels that just sort of feel right because it's just natural human behavior that we don't even realize are historical parallels at the time that a reader will be able to pick out. That's kind of the fun of working in a universe where it's people like us as opposed to being, you know, far, far away. All right. Um, so the future of wars, then, you got uh, your Earth or two coming up, and then you, there'll be the remainder of this, and hopefully there'll be a lot of, you know, there'll be more novellas coming out in the future, but you also mentioned a comic book series. We haven't heard too much about that. Um, obviously that's in the future, but can you give us a tidbit of information there for the audience? All I can really say at this point as far as the comic series goes is that it's starting out as three issues. I know it's been being worked on for a while. The artwork that I've seen, basically just pencil artwork at this point, looks pretty nice. It's another story that builds on some of these characters, or I guess in a sense we're building up characters that show up there, like uh, Ito Ryu showing up in Earther 2. But... It's, I'm not sure of a date of when we can expect that first storyline. I know that the idea is that if it's successful, to want to continue forward perhaps. You know, uh, sort of do maybe like what the Star Wars franchise did at one point and is sort of going back to now, which is sort of arc-based storytelling. Not necessarily this is issue 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, whatever, but maybe this is 1 through 3 of this arc, 1 through 5 of this arc, 1 through 6 of this other arc where it's sort of numbered by the different storylines so that it's not one ongoing series so much as here's a self-contained story. Maybe it can connects to something else later, but enjoy this for what it is. That way, if there isn't another future story, you don't feel like you've got a story that's been dropped in the middle that we never get to see an ending to or anything. I'm not sure where that's all heading. That's more a question for Josh, but from what I've seen, it's going to be it's gonna be pretty interesting stuff. And I like to be able to see the characters visualize there just like on the cards because to me when I write it helps me visualize uh, the characters and their interactions for instance in this case I needed to be able to visualize Gonjin armor and things like the artwork I've seen for the comic and the stuff from the game give me at least a sense of what that could look like how that could function so yeah I, th- I think you're gonna like it but there's not a whole lot of detail to provide just yet all right well 
Thank you for the information you could provide. Now, um, Wars hasn't been your uh, first published work. Uh, you wrote, a, if I'm correct about this, a novella and a novel before? That's right. Those were both uh, self-published, though they're, they're, there are new editions that are going to be actually professionally published through Grail Quest Books starting this year. All right. Can you tell us more about the uh, republishing of these? Sure. Uh, well, there's two stories. One is Echoes. That was a novella that I self-published back in 2006. It's essentially a cross between The West Wing, Law & Order, with an X-Files-ish twist that ties into, among other things, Ghosts. The, the Echoes title refers to uh, the name for ghosts in that particular story. It starts out as a murder mystery and very quickly becomes something with a lot more of the political intrigue to it. Right now, that's being beefed up a bit, adding a little more characterization to certain characters, adding a few more scenes here and there. It's getting beefed up certainly more than the other one is, and that is also not just in preparation for a release professionally through Grow Quest Books, but also the launch of at least one more book, if not two or more books, in that series. I'm working on concepts right now where the outline's pretty much done, but I haven't actually started writing for a, a sequel to that called Unity. So there's Echoes, and then presumably possibly some later on in that series. That'll be coming out, but I have really I still have a lot of work to do, and that's probably more of a summer thing where I'll get a chance to do a whole lot more work on that. And then Greater Good, I released a self-published back in 2009, and it's a self-contained novel. It's about 400 pages-ish, it, it, at least in paperback. It's a time travel story focusing on telepaths, telekinetics. Essentially what you've got is there's this society in the future – at, that essentially is run by a new elite, a new upper class of individuals. In this case, that, that new nobility, if you want to call it that, are telepaths, telekinetics, metahumans, they call themselves. And the idea is that in our present, someone has come back in time to try to stop that society from existing. And in coming back, they want to take out the ancestors of those who are most influential in, in starting that society, very much like you would expect with you know, it's a Terminator or something like that. In this case, it's essentially trying to create almost a genocide or an ethnic cleansing in the future, but not actually committing genocide in the future because it'd be so difficult. Yeah, just go back into the past and kill a few people. Be a serial killer. It's not quite as bad as being like a Nazi or something. So he's back in time trying to wipe out these nine people, these nine bloodlines, and there is another character who has come back in time to try to stop him. And in this case... In order to make the time travel make sense and to avoid some of those Einstein issues, I've had to develop a very unusual form of time travel for it that gets explained in a new afterword for the new edition. It gets a little more detail of where the ideas came from. But it basically blends things from deja vu, out-of-body experiences, the way people can remember things under hypnosis, and a little bit of the elements of something like, say, a quantum leap where – and it even uses some of the abortion debate issues about when life begins. You combine all those things together and you get a form of time travel where essentially a telepath, the little help in the future, can send their consciousness back through their lifetime into their mother's lifetime, through hers into her mother's, through hers into her mother's, until eventually getting to a point where essentially if you're in one smooth movement of your psyche, you can sort of rebound it almost like a bungee cord and get down to this one female ancestor and send yourself forward just one step back in the direction you came into one of her other children that isn't your direct ancestor. And that protects you from being wiped out necessarily in the future, possibly if something happens to you in the past. But it also allows her to be these male characters as opposed to all female characters because they're going through the mother's lifetime. Essentially, it's the idea that your, if your consciousness separates off from your mother at the time of conception or birth or whatever, if you are in a sense spiritually as far as a, a psychic energy – the same entity at one point, you can make that jump from that lifetime into the mother's lifetime and then on backwards. So here they are. They're in the bodies of someone who is part of their bloodline way back when. They're, 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 they're same minds, different bodies, so their abilities aren't quite as powerful as they would be in the future. And they're trying to they, – they each have their own goals, one trying to preserve the society, one trying to change it. In the middle – because there are so many people being killed, we have an FBI agent that comes in sort of as our primary uh, point of view character because she's the one kind of caught in the middle between these two. What is the greater good, preserving that society or wiping it out? Uh, is it best to preserve the lives now and risk problems later, or is it better to end the lives now and perhaps solve problems later? What is you know, the, the best scenario in which to go into? 
And as you go along in the book, it uses flash forwards, if you want to call it that. Basically, most of it's set in the present, but there are flashbacks, flash forwards, whatever you want to call it, that show events in the future from the personal pasts of both of the characters, the killer and the person trying to stop him. We learn much more about the future, uh, get a sense of who's right, who's wrong, or maybe the fact that maybe they're, it, it depends on your point of view. And just sort of builds up a much more in-depth story than anything else I've ever done before. I'm probably most proud of Greater Good than I am of anything else that, that I've written. And this new edition now has that full story. There's a, there, It's not changed very much. A few little tweaks of grammatical stuff here and there to make things a little more clear. There's three new inserts where we see sort of the pages from the manifesto of the terrorist group who sends the killer back in time in the first place to get a little more of their perspective earlier in the book. And now there's a new afterward to it that explains why certain concepts were done. There's a certain scene that involves the abortion debate issue where it goes into was there a political statement being made with that segment of the book or was it just part of the overall plot? Nothing should be read into it, that sort of thing. So that one, that one actually I've just finished all the workups for it. I've sent it off to Josh. He is in the process now. Uh, we just actually, as the night before we're recording this, we picked some cover image possibilities. So you should be seeing something official through Grill Quest Books sometime in the near future for that. And then presumably the first half of, of 2012 here, we'll be seeing that new professional edition of Greater Good. So lots of, of stuff going on, but it's, it's definitely been just a shock to me, and a great shock, a really cool thing that aside from writing from wars, Josh is interested in bringing these two story concepts into the fold, into the stable, so to speak, of of uh, Grail Quest Books' library uh, of franchise or library of universes of stories they're putting out alongside stuff like Stitch Crosses and such. Wow, you've been holding out on me, Dave, and you did not tell me that that book you wrote sounded so cool. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's one of those things where when you first describe it, you know, I try to describe it the way that the uh, the book's back cover describes it. The problem is the book's back cover, you know, back cover text isn't very big. You don't want to give away too much, but that really makes it kind of come off as sounding like a Terminator ripoff. You know, like like most sci-fi stories tend to remind uh, that are time travel tend to remind people of things like a Terminator. They seem to fit in these neat little categories, and I tried purposely to make sure it didn't fit into those neat little categories to avoid some of those tropes. But how do you describe that in a paragraph? You know, yeah. so yeah, a, a lot of explanation to it, but hopefully it's it's something people will want to check out. I know that it's been it was something that it took me a long time working on, but it's I I don't think I've surpassed it. I don't know. If it's possible for me to surpass it, it just it's I, I really felt like I gave my all to that thing and it turned out very, very well. Yeah, well I hope some of the people listening will check that out. I remember reading the back of it before and I, I got the impression you talked about from the back cover thing, but that's quite an intriguing sci fi. One would hope, one would hope. The only thing is I the way that it's the way that it's wrapped up, I don't foresee the ability for it to become a franchise in and of itself, you know, where it has sequels or anything like that. I think it's one of those stories that just kind of stands alone, and and that's it, you know. So uh, as as fun as it is, I don't want I I've thought about the idea of could there be a concept to continue from it, and I don't think anything could stand up to the first one to feel like it was building on. I think it would almost have to feel like a step down from the first one, the way that it was constructed. So so I'm I'm leaving Greater Good for its own little universe. I'm going to build up the the Echoes universe instead at this point. Yeah, so um, the, the process of writing in itself, uh, you know, you've had a little bit of experience here. You've uh, got Echoes, Greater Good, and now Two Wars novellas in Under Your Belt. Um, and I've had a little bit of a writing experience myself. I've written a play, Kryptos, and I can definitely relate to the um, what you were talking about in some of the afterwards part there, or what you were talking about with the afterwards, the writing something and... Uh, you know, having a political message in there and, you know, whether or not it's something that was intended, you know, how does the audience know? Um, and, you know, Wars itself has a lot of these things going on through it because, you know, you can draw some pretty intense parallels to things that are going on in our world just within it. You've got, you know, Earthers being, you know, a very completely corporatocracy, capitalist society, Gonjin moving to an insane version of socialism or communism or however you want to call it uh, and Mavericks who have become possibly a libertarian's dream society of you know personal freedom 
Um, and, you know, controlling how that appears to an audience who's reading the book. Yeah, it's a tricky thing because on the one hand, you don't want to offend the sensibilities of the audience, whoever it might be. But at the same time, you don't want to be so ambiguous or morally ambiguous, if you want to put it that way, that it seems like there's no punch to the convictions of the characters. You know, like, for instance, there is a, a situation in Greater Good and it's not a huge spoiler or anything, I don't think. It's, I mean, it's, it's been out, you know, for a couple years now, at least as a self-published version. There's an incident where you have a character who essentially, he wants to, the, the, the killer, he wants to wipe out the, the future bloodline here. So his whole thing is to stop these people from having the children that will eventually have children who have children and so on. And one of these people who is an intended victim turns out is pregnant at the time. And it becomes a question of, does it make him any less of a monster if instead of killing her and the baby with her, he, quote, saves her by forcing an abortion on her? And it, it, that whole scene and the way that everything plays out with that brings in our FBI agent character, who is a woman in this case. So she has a certain point of view on that. She's also a law enforcement officer. And the way that the scene plays out, it's funny because I've had people who are pro-life and pro-choice come to me saying that they saw a message that fit their point of view in those scenes. And there really wasn't one. Uh, the way that the character at reacts is with revulsion, but it's revulsion based on personal experience with a family member who had a miscarriage. And at the same time, reacting with a level of protection of the idea of abortion in general, not necessarily because of a personal opinion, but because she's a law enforcement officer. And if abortion is legal then it's her job, whether she likes it or doesn't like it, doesn't matter, to at least protect that legal rights existence. So here's a situation where you've got, an, you've got the audience able to draw conclusions that fit both their points of view, or if they want to be offended, can see it as offending their point of view, when really it's, you're, you have to create something that is true to those characters. You can't force a character to just be a mouthpiece for whatever point of view you want to get out there, if it's not in keeping with that character naturally you know what i mean and i think that's the thing mm -hmm. that and it's sort of the same thing with wars you know you can see the actions of a lot of the wars characters depending on which faction you support or which faction is your favorite you could see certain characters as absolute villains and yet at the same time to them they're heroic i think that the cool thing comes when you've got characters who uh not only could be seen as heroes or villains from either side because certainly for instance based on the first Earther novella, the Mavericks could see Rogan Hallard as an enemy, as a villain, because he stops the plans that they were trying to get the Shroud and everything. On the other hand, you could flip it around and say that the Mavericks, in trying to steal technology, they were the bad guys. But then you take someone like a Jylan Wraith, and he is someone who, even by the good, even by the so-called good guys, even by the Earther perspective in that particular novella, yeah, he's still a pretty shady guy. You know, so even within your different sides of issues and your different sides of a conflict, you've got those those inside uh, issues, whether it's an issue over a particular political topic or characterizations, hero, villain. Uh, it, it, there's, there's a lot of complexity to be found when you're writing, as long as you're willing to let the characters sort of, I, I know this sounds stupid, but, but writers say it all the time and it's true, let them be true to themselves. Sometimes you just gotta let go and let the character do their thing, you know, in your imagination. And you might be surprised at where they wind up taking you in how they do their thing. It, it sounds so bizarre. It almost sounds every writer sound like they're somehow got multiple personalities in their head. <laughs> but you almost, you almost have to. Uh, find, give them a voice, but if you give them a voice, let them use it. You know, don't, don't try to shoehorn them into something, which is great for Wars because Wars has such a diverse cast and with, with so many different points of view that are available... You can find a character that fits a mold you want to tell your story without having to shoehorn anybody into anything, which is, is terrific, in my opinion. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, one thing I was really surprised with when uh, the new novellas started coming out, and uh, don't take this the wrong way, but I was so surprised that they were all good. Um, you know, you would expect that there would, uh, you know, generally when you people are starting up these sort of things, you're going to come out with, you know, a little bit of, oh, well, trying to fit it into a very narrow viewpoint so that it it's simplified and easier to deal with, more 
malleable to just say, oh, well, these guys are the good guys and roll with that, taking a one sided view of it all. But even, you know, from the very first novella, you uh, the Mavericks in there, you know, they were doing something that was pretty probably wrong. But at the same time, you could see why they were doing it as characters. They weren't just twirling their mustaches. Of, I beat they were women, so they wouldn't have mustaches. But if they had mustaches... Well, you never know. You never know. It is the future. Maybe they can have those implanted or something. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. But, um... Yeah. It's, you know, just the fact that uh, the people were all portrayed as people who were all going about what they wanted to do rather than following into some sort of stereotype about what people would, you know, think they were going to do, for instance. I think that what happens with with this series, at least, since it's not just, you know, wars, the Battle of Phobos, and then here's these nine books, it's faction-based, it's divided by the three, you don't have to hit people over the head as much with, this is the faction whose side you're seeing most. It's more of a guiding thing reminding us of who our main characters we're going to follow in that case. Uh, so in the case of the Earther stuff, following mainly the Earthers, but you want to try to get the different sides' points of view in. The, the most interesting villain, of course, is the villain that doesn't think of himself as a villain. You know, they, they have to have what they think of as good motivations. I think especially with Earther 2 compared to Earther 1, you're going to be able to see that because in Earther 1, you know, you've got Grager who's basically out for money. You've got uh, Pepper Tokarates, you've got Joker Danico working for the gambler, but essentially they're out for the technology and eventually money. You know, it's, it's still that profit-based kind of thing. Whereas, you know, Rogan and them, they're there to try to save lives. And you kind of wonder what exactly the mission is that Jalen Rath is, or Wraith is tied into. But, you know, there's, there's that level of, you know, you can sort of tell which motive is more pure, so to speak. Whereas with Earther 2... You know, looking at the points of view, you not only have the Earther point of view, uh, you, actually, you almost have two different Earther points of view, one or two different views for Gonjin, and you've got Kipley caught in the middle. Because on the Earther side, I almost say three points of view. You've got Hicks' view and Howler's view, which taken separately are a little bit different. Taken together are a little bit different than Rogan and his team's point of view. And of course, the Earthers are different in point of view than the Gonjin. With Gonjin, you've got Ryu, or Ito Ryu's point of view, you got the point of view of other Ganjin in general as a society and as the Atarashi Hajimari. And then caught in the middle, you've got Kipley, who is ostensibly an Earther, but who has those, those different historical views, those diplomatic views of Ganjin, and leaves uh, the, the issue open of what's going to happen with his personal family. So again, it's, it's one of those where if you're true to the characters, you almost have to give them some true motivation. It, it takes a real madman to be a villain who is just there to cause chaos. I mean, even in greater good, the, the person, and that's, that's where the idea of the greater good comes from, where the title comes from. The killer believes that what he's doing is absolutely right. It will make for a better future, even if the means now is murder. The hero character, presumably hero character, Cray, he believes that protecting that future society is the greater good. It's in the best interest of all, and protecting lives now is in the greater good of all. But as the story progresses with that novel, you'll find that it's not nearly as black and white as that. You're facing some, as a reader, facing some tough decisions on who to even root for. One of the instances in that particular book is you take something like uh, uh, some of the darker elements of our human history, uh, our, our real history. Usually when you see ethnic cleansing or genocide, when you see people using mass murder or wiping out of an entire group of people as a political tool, when you see that happening, it's in situations where the government itself is totalitarian, authoritarian, where the government itself is abusive of its power. So usually it's easy to pick the good guy and the bad guy. Well, anybody standing up against that, they're the good guys. And the ones who are doing that, they're the bad guys. Well, what happens when what you've got essentially is you separate genocide and totalitarianism into two sides of a situation. Neither one is necessarily the best option. But now you have to choose. How do you choose between those? And is there an option for another path, one way or the other? Uh, in a sense, it's those types of tough questions that are in greater good for the reader. So yeah, absolutely, you've got to make your villains believable, their motives believable. Otherwise, 
it, it's it's a very flat kind of book. And and yeah, a lot of times when franchises are starting, you do wind up with stories that are very simplified, and you they're it's like they're telling you who to root for, and it's overloaded. I was very wary in Earth or One of giving too much backstory. You know, I mean, you can tell now my answers are long. I I, I go into detail. I try to explain as I go. It's the educator in me. But it's the same kind of thing. When you're writing prose fiction, you can go overboard in giving way too much background information. This is the info dump. You know, here's all this. But I had to find ways, being sort of the Tim Zahn type position for wars, having to reignite it in a sense, you know, I had to find ways to fit in some of that background information in there. And so did Jim, so did Sean, and so does Sabrina. And Josh will eventually have to also. So it's a it's a fine line, but we take this very very seriously. We weren't necessarily all fans of Wars before the series start. The series of novellas started to be worked on, but at this point, we are all fans of Wars, and we want to treat the property with the respect that it deserves. It's a well crafted sci fi universe. To manhandle it and not give it its due, not give the characters their due, I I think that'd be disrespectful of the frame. Yeah, well, definitely, <laughs> and. You know, it's good that it has been as respected as it's been so far that, uh, you know, these novellas are bringing in people to wars and more fans than it's had since, well, 2004, 2005. Yeah, I mean, the thing about this is we're hoping to reach out and hopefully it's doing that. We're hoping to reach out to different audiences. I mean, there's the people who have never read wars before or never seen wars before, getting them into it maybe through the novellas. Or we've got folks who played the game, want to bring in back because they were players of the game. And you have the others out there who might be familiar with me or with Jim or with Sean or with Josh or Sabrina or whoever that we might be able to pull in there. Uh, in my case, for instance, I'm hoping that what we're going to see or what we have seen is that people who are either listening to uh, my podcast or followed the, the thing I did for Star Wars Tales or maybe followed my the, the self-published versions of Echoes or Greater Good might make that jump and pick up wars and be introduced to stuff by the other authors, too, and be brought in. We're trying to cast a very wide net here as far as, as potential audience. But that also means you can't assume that anybody in the audience knows a single thing about the background of the wars universe before you write. So we have to lay things out without feeling like we're spoon feeding like a baby saying, and this is what the Ganjin do, and here's why it's called Ganjin, and just kind of spoon feeding everything. We've got we to gotta be careful with it, but we are trying to cast a wide net here. Yeah, and you know, it's, there wasn't really that much information to go on before. Even fans who've been fans of it since it originally premiered, like myself, you know, there was plenty of information that just wasn't even readily available at all about it and there are still plenty of holes to be filled in you know the entire reason that this uh set of prequel trilogy of trilogy novellas is you know fits in so well is there really wasn't much backstory uh i can recall only finding out that the she reproduce asexually by budding after i managed to find copies of the original wars radio podcast from Decipher's website and listening to them talk about $10,000 tournaments in Las Vegas in 2004 and wading through that just to get, oh, well, that's how that works. So, you know, it's good that this information is, you know, getting out there. And uh, the ways you guys have done it have been really well. Uh, but you all chose different methods, which was interesting. And all of them seem to fit the factions you chose well. Uh, the Gonjin novella had the shifting back and forth between the uh, creation of Shocho in the 2060s and into the future and the actual era of wars. Uh, then you have Jim Perry's novella, who began with his flashback and then flash forwarded. And then you have your own, where it's the Earthers who have the most stable society, because it's Earth, where the information is simply, you know, it's casually passed along throughout everything that's going on, because for the Earthers, there is no need to go and reflect on how things were, because this is how things have always been. Yeah, the Earthers, in a sense, are, they are the ones that probably should feel more familiar, especially to American audiences, 
so in their case, it's much more about you have to find those times where it makes sense to reflect on either a piece of technology. Uh, in that case, for instance, they're they're zooming on their way off on their mission, and Rogan is frustrated by how long it's taking. That's a good time to start talking about the way the grav drives worked. What does that do as far as opening up you know the solar system to exploration and exploitation and such? In the case of the 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 political views, I guess, coming from Earth, one really good thing that can be used for something like that is things like news broadcasts, you know, because news broadcasts in and of themselves are usually, they're, they're slightly skewed toward whatever the audience is they're trying to speak to, whether it's Earth or Ganjin or whoever. But at the same time, they have to provide enough information for the audience of the news broadcast to understand the context of what's going on. So if you use those within the context of a story, they can provide some of that necessary info without it feeling like it's just a narrative info dump, as I call it, within the prose, a lot of exposition. Instead, you can have something being heard within the actual environment of the story, someone saying it or seeing it on a screen that's able to give those details. But yeah, it's, it's one of those things where Earth no longer has to make a case for being what it is, so much as the others are trying to make their case for, for instance, for the Ganj and why they are independent from Earth, and in the case of the Mavericks, why they are doing the things that they're doing their way. Uh, it's almost like Earth is the norm that everything else is referenced against, and usually referenced in a, from the perspective of Ganjin or Maverick, as something they don't want to be anymore. But for the Earthers still wanting to be it, there's not a lot of that, that self-reflection that has to go on. Yeah, so I've asked you quite a few questions now about wars, your other works. Is there anything you'd just like to, that you wanted to talk about that you haven't had a chance to yet? Not really, other than just I'm, I'm curious to see, you know, what people think of Earth or Two when it comes out. And I really, you know, it, open invitation, make sure you check out Wars Universe on Facebook. Because there's a lot of discussion that goes on there. You know, there's a Facebook page for the Battle of Phobos series, Facebook page for Wars itself. So there's a lot of interaction to be done that maybe people haven't had a chance to, to try out yet. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you for joining us here today, Nathan. Oh, you're quite welcome. All right. Well, you've been listening here to Wars Radio with two with James Robert Cruz Wilder and our special guest, Nathan Patrick Butler. Thank you for joining in, and we hope to see you again next week.